morning, St. Stephen. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for letting me be here this morning. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that you favored me and watched over me last night and everyone here. And Heavenly Father, I thank you as we breathe in your breath of life all through the night, you infuse our brains and our hearts with love. And Heavenly Father, you woke us up this morning on time. Heavenly Father, you clothed us in a right mind. And Heavenly Father, you gave us a new day. And Heavenly Father, we're here to give you praise because you are worthy, Heavenly Father. You are the one who gave your one and only Son, Heavenly Father, the light of the world. The light of the world on Calvary, Heavenly Father. He hung and bled and died. And Heavenly Father, we're all sinners saved by grace. Hallelujah. I just thank you, Heavenly Father, for this church. And I thank you for the leadership of this church, Heavenly Father. I ask your anointing on the pastor and his staff. Heavenly Father, we need you. There's Satan's out there trying to turn us around. But Lord, we got our, our eyes fixed on the cross. We are going forward. Lord, we see the light in Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. And we're gonna, we're gonna walk with him. We might be running to and fro throughout the world, but we got our eyes fixed on Jesus. Heavenly Father, we just love you and we praise you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cross. Without the cross, we wouldn't be here, Heavenly Father. Without the cross, we would have no grace. Without the cross, we would have no mercy. Heavenly Father, we would have no healing. Heavenly Father, we would have no anointing. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Trinity. Heavenly Father, without you, where will we be? Oh, give him honor, Heavenly Father. Oh, church, give him praise. Heavenly Father, say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We love you, Heavenly Father. And we thank you for you giving your life on the cross. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the people that we memorialized today that went out and gave their lives for us. Heavenly Father, help us not to take our freedom for granted. Heavenly Father, help us to give you the honor, give you the praise. Heavenly Father, I anoint your spirit in this place. Heavenly Father, hallelujah. I lift you up, God. I praise your holy name. I thank you that you're a God who loves. I thank you are a God who gives. I thank you for a God that knows everything. You know all about my trials. I'm still here, God, because of you. I thank you, Lord. You brought me through the heartache. You brought me through the storm. And Heavenly Father, I'm still here. I'm standing, Heavenly Father. I'm standing on the promises of God. Praise you, Heavenly Father. Anoint this church, Heavenly Father. Let us be a light in the community. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We love you. And we give you all the honor. And we give you all the praise. Heavenly Father, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise your name. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus. Woo, don't you love it? Don't you love that name of Jesus? In your precious name we pray, Father. We pray, we give you all the honor and all the glory and all the praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Woo! Let's stand to our feet and continue to praise and worship. If God has ever brought you through a situation, I say we give him some praise right here. If you've ever been in a place of darkness and the God of which, the which we serve has shown his light upon you, I say this is the place you give him praise. Amen? Even as you're coming in, Father, let him be ready to praise your name today. Amen? Amen.
Anybody know how great it is to call the name of Jesus? Whatever you're going through, you can just call the name of Jesus and you feel all right. There's something on the inside that can't nobody give you but God. I tell you, there's something magical about calling that name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I know somebody in here came to have church, and I'm not by myself. I, I know the God I serve has been too good. Yeah, we may be cute, but you can still give God some praise, amen? Yes. Oh, yes. All right.
Amen, amen. Let's give God glory, honor, and praise that is due him. Glory, honor, and praise that is due him. Make us aware of his presence. His presence is in this place. More importantly, 
His presence is in you if you know him as Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. God is good. Let's give this choir a hand of encouragement as well. Blessing our hearts. Love it, love it, love it. The band is doing what the band do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. They sounding good as well. Very grateful to you and sound, mixing and putting it all together. Video, thank you, thank you. It is sounding good in the house. Always start off with the thank yous. And uh, this morning, want to say thank you to all of the members and guests of St. Stephen. Give yourselves a hand of encouragement. You are in the house. You are here electronically. And we are just grateful for you. Amen. Turn to your neighbors and say, neighbor, I am grateful for you. And then point to the one behind you and say, even you, even you, I'm, I'm grateful for you. Yeah, yeah, let them know. Amen, amen, amen. God is good. We praise God for his presence. We are Memorial Day weekend, and it kicks off, as you know, between Memorial Day and Labor Day, the 101 critical days of summer. And so I just want everyone to be prayerful, to be vigilant as you travel, do different things, connect with family. Uh, that you are careful, even with the backyard barbecue, that the fire doesn't become a big fire. You know, and just be careful as you celebrate through this summer. Amen? Amen. Uh, we do still have bereavement in the family. I know a lot of you already know uh, Reverend Charles Anderson had a sibling, a sister, to pass away, and so we want to be in prayer for him and his family. And then also Brother Brian Sanders, uh, his father passed away as well. And so be in prayer for Brother Brian Sanders and his family as they go through this time of bereavement. We know the God of comfort, peace, and strength uh, will walk with them through all of this, uh, but we just pray God's choices, blessings be upon them. Amen? And we know he will do just that. Also wanted to give you an update on Molly. Uh, some of you may or may not know uh, we have a ministry work going on there. It's been going on there a good while now, over a decade in Mali, West Africa, and uh, we have gone beyond really adopting a village. Our tithes and offering continue to minister in that area. Uh, we have some of our translators that we've had in the past that still go to the villages that we have connected with uh, in West Africa, and the latest report that we received, they, because they go every single month out to these villages, uh, but they went to not only the village that we adopted, but some surrounding villages. And so proud to let you know that 13 people accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. That's huge, 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 huge. In a very Islamic culture where you can literally be pushed out of the entire community for accepting Jesus Christ. And so we praise God for that. So thank you, St. Stephen. Your tithes and your offering are making a difference. It, it has a global reach, but more importantly, it also has a global touch and uh, it impacting the lives, not only locally and nationally, but internationally, which is what it is all about. Amen. And so we praise God for what he's doing in and through uh, the ministry there in Mali, uh, West Africa. With that being said, want to uh, acknowledge our guests. We are grateful for you being with us this morning. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, we're praying that today you'll get to know him. He loves you, and he wants to save your soul. We do want to acknowledge any first-time guests. If you are here for the very first time, uh, if you don't mind, could you please stand? We'd like to see any first-time guests that are with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you for standing. Thank you for standing. And more importantly, thank you for being with us this morning. We know you passed at least 3,982 churches on your way here this morning. So we're grateful that you're at St. Stephen. If you don't have a church home, pray about St. Stephen. Make it your church home. As we exit today after the 8 o'clock service, feel free to go out of door number 7, and we do want to place a gift in your hands. Amen? Amen. Praise God for you. Uh, also, want to take time. We are blessed. Speaking about missions, uh, we do have a team leaving for Toronto uh, this coming Friday. And so, amen, amen. And so I would like to take some time to uh, commission that team. And if I have it correctly, the, the leaders of the, the team is brother and sister Alando Al and Faye Patrick. They can come on down. Sister Phyllis Stroud. Sister Ruby Weska, Sister Ruth Lewis, Brother Devin Hope, Brother Edgar Macario. If 
They can come on down. For those that are here, some are here, some are not. And then, of course, any of our members that have gone on any kind of mission trip, if you can come up, our ministers, deacons, board, if you don't mind coming up as well, uh, we want to lay our hands on and pray and intercede on their behalf. Uh, they are going to be going to Toronto working with at least 200 different language groups in that area. And so they have a task before them. It can be the work can be very broad in what they're going to be doing. And so we just pray God's choices, blessings be upon them as they move forward. And so they leave uh, this Friday and they come back the following Saturday. And so uh, be in prayer each day as they are out and about that God would indeed, indeed keep them safe and secure and also preserve their homes while they are away. Amen. And so the scripture says in Acts 1, 8, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. If you are willing to be his witnesses, say we are. It says, unto both Jerusalem and into Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And then over in Mark, the 16th chapter, it lays it out clearly and says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. He said, And these signs shall follow them that believe. Many shall say, shall be able to cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and they sh if they shall drink of any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So powerful in that text, and we're praying indeed that when they lay hands, when they speak words, that God's power will move in and through them. Let's pray together. Saints, even if we could rest on our feet as well, stretch our hands towards our missionaries. Uh, we have the Fantastic Seven going on this trip. Let's pray. Father, we do come to you in the name that is above every other name. We're grateful for ministry and grateful for service. Grateful for these who have stepped up and said, here I am, Lord. Send me, use me for your glory and for your honor. Father, I pray that you would empower them with your precious Holy Spirit. We know they know you, and so your spirit resides, but I pray, Lord, that they can walk in your spirit. Father, so that when they indeed do lay hands, that your power moves in and through them. And Father, we pray for the recipients. Uh, Lord, you know everything that's going on in Canada and Toronto. You know all the different languages. Lord, in this same book of Acts, you set it up so that everyone could hear one another in different tongues and languages and dialects. And I pray, Lord, that the international language would come forth, which is love, that they would feel grace, that they would feel mercy, they would feel significance, they will feel acceptance. Father, I pray for the team's health and well-being, Lord, as they go in different climates and eat different foods and be in different areas, Lord, that you preserve, protect their body. And then, Lord, I pray that you would allow them to walk and to move as one. We pray for their leaders, that you be with Brother and Sister Patrick as well, and Give them wisdom and beyond their years and insight. And then, Lord, we know the enemy does not want this to go forth, but we know greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world, and we bind him right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, we pray that you set up Holy Ghost headquarters all around this trip. We pray most of all, Father, that souls will be saved. And then, Lord, if any believers are there, that they're also encouraged to run a little while longer. Then, Father, we pray as they are away from their families that you would bless and keep their, homes, their households and every aspect of their being as only you can do. We surrender them to you and we give you the glory in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for serving. We'll be praying for you every single day that you're gone. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you all. Thank you. Amen. It is now my distinct honor and privilege to introduce our speaker of the hour. And if you've been around St. Stephen a couple days, you know exactly who I'm talking about. Reverend John B. Nickens III is going to bless us with the word. Amen. And 
I would tell you what the B stands for, but he might get upset, so I will keep that to myself. But uh, we are grateful for him. If you haven't seen him around a lot, he is one of the lead, uh, actually, not only minister, but um, musician over at Mount Zion Baptist Church in Ontario. And so uh, he is using his gifts for the glory of God, but he says, I'm still a member of St. Stephen. I said, of course, of course. And so we are grateful to have the word from him uh, today. And you know, he always brings it in a very unique way. And, and I'm sure at some point, I hope I'm not putting pressure on him, he will give one of those comical stories uh, that he always has. And so uh, we're looking forward to that. But before that happens and he comes forth, of course, uh, we do have baptism today, and we will also have the offering. And so I'm going to ask the Reverend Dr. Francis, if he doesn't mind, to come up and bless the offering. And right after, well, right before, actually, before you do the offering, we do have a video. I want to leave that out. So right after the video, Reverend Dr. Francis, we have our monthly Street Speaks video, and it is on long-suffering after that, Reverend Dr. Francis will come for the offering, and then Reverend John Johnson will come for the scripture and prayer for our baptism. Amen. God bless you. We are looking forward to hearing what the streets have to say about long suffering. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Have you ever heard a word called long suffering? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think I. Okay. Have you ever heard of the word long suffering? Long suffering isn't that another term for patience in a sense? It's uh, it's a word that's in the Bible, and it it really speaks about patience, being patient. The church I used to attend had this uh, praise and worship song singing about the fruit of the Spirit. Mm. Love, joy, peace, patience and kindness, goodness and self-control, faithfulness, gentleness. But of course, looking at it in the Bible, I came across as certain translations come across as calling it long-suffering. What kind of things do you do to help you be more patient? Help me be more patient, I think. Um, breathing exercises, meditating. Mm. Definitely stuff like that. Um, I like to so breathe nice. Do you kind of inhale and exhale? Stuff like that, yeah. Very good. All right. Patience okay. is, is long-suffering. Long-suffering is patience. Patience is simply being able to live with a situation as you hope for it to become better. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Long-suffering is a big deal. It is not easy. But the streets are speaking, hopefully... It helped us until we meet again. Let's pray. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. For indeed, Father, we are reminded that the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, so that all that we possess, all that we manage, is yours and as we come forth and bring back a portion of what you so graciously given unto us we pray that it will be used and blessed and multiplied in a way that will bring men and women boys and girls out of the darkness to the marvelous light the light of Jesus and that you bless the gifts and the giver to God be the glory and we give you thanks forevermore for being our supply 
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts for baptism. From the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan, and to John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And though the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Father, we just want to pause to say thank you for this moment. Thank you, Lord, that baptism is still going on, dear God. Salvation is still available, dear God. We thank you. Lord, we pray that as these new converts come in, Lord, and being submerged in water, that when they come up, Lord, that they have a new life worth living. And, Father, continue to be with them. Let the Holy Spirit lead them and guide them. Comfort them, convict them, heal them, deliver them. Whatever the Spirit does, that you will get the glory. Thank you for welcoming us again into this house. Thank you that the seed is still growing. It's being planted. It made me feel good about Molly. That they're still being saved. We thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for salvation this morning. Lord, we thank you that you gave us another day to try to get it right. Because we know that you're coming. And Father, we want to be ready. We give you the glory, we give you the praise, and we give you the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God for Kalia, who has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior at her tender age, came down courageously and said, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I want to be baptized. Amen. We baptize you today, our daughter, not to save you. We baptize you today because you are already saved. We baptize you today in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Praise God as well for Daly, who has accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Amen. And her name, I'm sure, speaks of her walk. She will walk with the Lord daily. 
as I'm sure. So we baptize you today not to save you, our daughter. We baptize you today because you're already saved. We baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Can I say that again? Oh, I've learned how to live holy. I've learned how to live holy. Free. 
see Jesus. Father, we do come to you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. 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 What a day it will be when we see Jesus. All our heartache, all our pain, it'll be over. But what is well with our soul, I'm grateful for your presence, I'm grateful for your love. Thank you, Lord, for your healing. Thank you, Lord, for sustaining us. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry of song that gives us the reminder when we see Jesus. We'll be able to say amen. No more sickness. No more pain. No more sorrow. For all of it, Lord, we say thank you. We're humbled to be in your presence. Just to think about a mansion that's waiting on us. Streets paved with gold. What an awesome God you are. Lord, we just want to pray a special prayer in this graduation season and promotions that you would be with our young people and Lord, we know there are so many challenges all around them and temptations. We pray that you preserve, protect those that are moving from the first grade to the second grade, from preschool to elementary, from elementary to middle school, middle to high, high into college, college into careers, those going into the military. Lord, we just pray, Lord, in this season of turning a chapter, that you would encamp your angels of protection around those that are precious in our communities and in our families. Lord, that you give them a charge and a challenge. 
as you said in 1 Timothy 4, to despise not thy youth, but to be an example of the believers in word, thought, and deed in every aspect of their lives. Thank you, Lord, for the offspring. Thank you, Lord, for not only the future, but the present. Continue to use them for your glory. Bless now this service. Bless your manservant. Anoint him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. Not only bless him, Lord, but prepare our hearts and mind that this word will land on fertile soil, that we walk out better than the way we walked in. Oh, God, we give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. Because when we see Jesus... It will be all, all over in the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ. All of God's people said, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Give somebody a big hug. Let them know when I see Jesus. Reverend John B. Nix III. Let's give that wonderful band a hand. Let's give uh, the praise team and the choir a hand. Give yourselves a hand. It's always good to be home. Happy to be home. Happy to be back. And yes, you are stuck with me. I am eternally a member forever and always. Let us pray. Father God, we're just asking that you just... Bless this word, bless the message, Father God, bless the hearts of your people, Father God, that something will be said to encourage a closer walk with you, Father God, or that someone may come crying, what must I do to be saved, Father God? We thank you in advance, Father God, for what you're going to do. And we do this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. And they all said, amen. amen. And so this month, the theme being long-suffering. In today's world, there's no shortage of situations that can be classified as problematic. We have problems in our homes. We have problems amongst family members. We have problems between family members, problems at our workplace, problems with our friends and acquaintances, problems in the political arena, problems everywhere. And problems affect our demeanor and how we conduct ourselves with people. And sometimes you may fall victim to this behavior, and someone just may call you out and say, what is your problem? So as we're on the theme of long suffering this month, we want to speak briefly, I won't be before you long, with this theme in mind. What is your problem, and what are you going to do about it? What is your problem, and what are you going to do about it? If you could stand for the reading of God's word, the passage is found in the book of Genesis, the 50th, 5-0 chapter. If you have any problems finding Genesis, we have many Sunday school classes here <laughs> that you can enroll in today. The book of Genesis, the 50th chapter, and the 20th verse. Genesis 50 and 20. When you found it, can we get a hearty amen? amen? And it reads thusly, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. It says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many 
people alive. God bless you. You may take your seat. And so <clears throat> the individual speaking here is Joseph. And so we're going to review the story of Joseph to get us up to speed to chapter 50, verse 20. Verse 20. And if we review the, the, the story of Joseph, we know that Joseph's father was Jacob. And Jacob's name was later changed to Israel. Now, Jacob loved Joseph very much, even more than any of his other sons. And he had made him a multicolored tunic. Joseph's brothers recognized the favoritism Joseph had from his father, Jacob, and they hated him for it. They hated him so much they couldn't even speak to him civilly. The Bible tells us they couldn't even talk to him on friendly terms. Well, as we review the story, we know Joseph had a dream. And when he told them about the dream, they hated him even more. In Genesis chapter 37 and verse 7, it tells us that Joseph told them this. He said, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. But not only that, in chapter 9, I mean in verse 9 of the same chapter, chapter 37, verse 9, it says that, Joseph had another dream. It says, now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Look at your neighbor and say, be careful who you share your dreams with. <clears throat> and so a day came when Jacob sent his sons to pasture to tend the flock. He sent them to a place called Shechem. Well, Joseph sent, Jacob sent Joseph to check on his brothers. But when Joseph went looking, he didn't find them. And he came upon a stranger. And he was wandering. He asked the stranger, have you seen my brothers? The stranger told him, no, they were here, but they went to Dothan. So Joseph went, to, Joseph went to Dothan to see about his brothers. Now his brothers saw him in the distance. They saw him coming, and they hated him so much, they hatched a plot against him. They said to each other, let's kill him and throw him in one of the pits, and we'll say a vicious animal devoured him. Then we'll see about him in his dreams. But thank God for Brother Reuben, because Reuben said, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in the pit, but don't lay a hand on him. You see, Reuben had planned to come back and get him later and bring him home. And so we know that even when everybody is against you, God always has someone on your side to do right by you. And so when Joseph got close, they took the coat of many colors off, the multicolored tunic, if you will, and they threw him in an empty pit. It didn't have any water in it. They just threw him in an empty pit. They didn't kill him, but they decided to sell him to a group of Midianite traders. And so they sold him, and Joseph was brought into Egypt. Now, Reuben came back, and Joseph wasn't there, and Reuben got upset, but they had to tell their father something. So they all decided to slaughter a male goat and dip Joseph's tunic in the blood and go back to his father Jacob and tell him a wild animal had killed and eaten Joseph. And so Joseph ended up in Egypt, and the Midianites sold him to Potiphar. Potiphar was one of Pharaoh's officers, and he was the captain of the bodyguard for Pharaoh. And in Genesis, the 39th chapter, and the second verse, it tells us that the Lord was with Joseph. And so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Look at somebody else and tell him, if God is for me, who can be against me? <laughs> and so Joseph moved into the house of his master, and his master saw that the Lord was with Joseph. And everything he did prospered. So Joseph found favor and became the man's personal servant. The man made him overseer over everything and put him in charge of everything he owned. Now we know Joseph was very attractive, very attractive young man. So the master's wife began to have designs on him, began to try and entice Joseph and sleep to sleep with her, but Joseph refused. And so we know she got upset, and because of this, Joseph was falsely accused of sexual harassment and put into prison. Say it again, if God is for me, who can be against me? <laughs> and 
And so Joseph was put in prison, but the Lord was with him even in prison. And so Joseph gained favor in the eyesight of the prison warden. And the warden put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. And verse 23 of chapter 39 in Genesis tells us the warden didn't even check up on what Joseph did because the warden trusted him so much because he knew the Lord was with him and the Lord made whatever Joseph did prosper. And so we know from earlier that Joseph was a dreamer, so he knew something about dreams. One day Pharaoh got upset with the cupbearer and the baker and he threw them in prison. Well, both of them had a dream the same night, and each dream had its own interpretation. Joseph talked to them about it, and he ended up interpreting both of their dreams correctly. Now, for the baker, you can read this for yourself, it didn't turn out so well, just like Joseph had interpreted. However, for the cupbearer, it turned out favorably. But even still, he didn't remember Joseph when he got out and forgot all about him and left him in prison. Well, it was a few years later, Pharaoh had a dream. And it was at this time that same cupbearer who Joseph had correctly interpreted his dream told Pharaoh, well, when he was in prison, there was a Hebrew there who interpreted his dream and he did it correctly. So Pharaoh sent word to the prison and called for Joseph. And Joseph got himself all cleaned up and Pharaoh told Joseph he had had a dream. And Joseph began to interpret Pharaoh's dream correctly and he told him there'd be seven years of plenty and abundance and seven years of famine. And Joseph told him what the plan should be was to collect all the food in the good years that are coming up and store the grain so when the lean years came, the people wouldn't die because of the famine. Well, after everything was said and done, Joseph was made a ruler over Egypt. And what he interpreted did indeed come to pass. Seven years of abundance came, and then seven years of famine. And so in the subsequent chapters, there's some back and forth interaction with Joseph uh, with his brothers who had come to Egypt during the famine. They didn't recognize him, even though they were in the presence of him. But after all that was said and done, that brings us to chapter 50, verse 20, which tells us Joseph told them what you meant for evil, God meant it for good to bring about this present result and keep many people alive. And so we see Joseph had some problems in his life. But what we want to take note of is not so much that he had problems, but what was his attitude while he was going through the problems. See, even though he had problems, he never lost faith in God, and God was with him even through his problems. And that's what we want to take home today. It doesn't matter what you perceive your problems to be. If you remain faithful to God, he will be with you in the midst of your problems. He never promised you you wouldn't have problems, but he did promise you he would be with you as you go through the problems. Now, we remember early on in the story, Joseph was thrown into a pit by his brothers who were jealous of him. Has anyone ever felt that they were thrown into a pit, a pit of depression, a pit of financial problems, a pit of marital issues, a pit of issues with your children or with your friends? or with your loved ones, or maybe even a pit of low self-esteem, not feeling like you're good enough. These are all problems. But as we said and asked the question earlier, what's your problem and what are you going to do about it? So we see Joseph had made it to Egypt and God was with him and he began to flourish. But then in the middle of that, as we just said, someone lied on him and he was put into prison. But even in prison, Joseph maintained the same attitude of faithfulness so much that God was with him even in prison. This tells us that Joseph's faith was strong regardless of his circumstances. Have you ever felt like you're in prison, prisoner of your own decisions or your circumstances? We're not talking about the problem. We're talking about what's your attitude when you're in the middle of the problem. And so we see Joseph remained steadfast in his faith even when others had forgotten about him and left him in prison to rot, his faith was strong, and so God was still with him. He was made ruler over Egypt, and the same people that sold him into slavery, which was his own family, he came across them and he treated them kindly and did not seek revenge. Ultimately, he did not do to them what they had done to him. And how many of us would have had that same attitude? How many of us would not seek to repay evil with evil? 
And that's why the question today is, what is your problem and what are you going to do about it? Joseph remained steadfast in his faith in spite of his problems. And so what Joseph did, if I might put it like this, he didn't focus on the problem, but he did what all of us should do when we experience any problem in life. Don't focus on the problem, focus on the problem solved. And the problem solver is Jesus Christ. And so what I want you to take home with you today is don't focus on the problem no matter what you're going through. Focus on the problem solver. God never promised us this journey would be easy, but he did say it would be worth it. So focus on the problem solver. Is that easy all the time? No, it is not. As we said earlier, there's many problems facing us today in the world. People want to take sides for political reasons. Political candidates are tearing families apart because of differences and choices of a particular candidate. We have an election coming up over the next few months. There's a war in Ukraine that's still going on. There's an Israeli-Palestine war going on. There's genocide in Africa still going on. But while it is never a good idea to bury your head in the sand, I advise you don't get too caught up in the hype because the White House is not what you need to be focused on. You should be concerned with it, yes, but the White House is not your ultimate objective to focus on. The White House does not control your destiny. God controls your destiny. And some of us are taking sides with the Israeli-Palestinian crisis. Well, I'd like to let you know that these two different groups have been fighting for thousands of years. The Palestinians, in truth, are blood brothers or cousins of modern-day Israelis, and they're all descendants of Abraham and Ishmael, so to speak. So don't be getting too worked up taking sides in a family fight <coughs> that you're not a part of. Both of them have done wrong, and that is for God to work out. We have an election coming up, and some people are worked up over this candidate or that candidate. But in reality, both of the main candidates are problematic. And I'm, I'm putting it mildly. On one hand, one candidate says if he's not elected, there's going to be blood in the streets and bloodshed. But on the other hand, the candidate that's in there right now decided that March 31st, which just happened to fall on Resurrection Sunday morning, would be announced as Transgender Visibility Day. Now, even though it's based on the date of March 31st, it happened to fall on Easter Sunday. My point is not the date. My point is that it happened at all. <laughs> so don't get too worked up over this candidate or that candidate because they're each one, each one is problematic. Your hope is not in the candidate. Your hope is not in the White House. Your hope is not what's going on in the world. Your hope is in Jesus. <laughs> and so, again, take this home with you. What's your problem and what are you going to do about it? Don't focus on the problem. Focus on the problem solver. I'm reminded in the second, uh, uh, second book of Kings, in the sixth chapter, Elisha, our former pastor's namesake, or our former pastor's namesake of Elisha, Elisha and his servant were surrounded by troops and horses. And Elisha's servant flew into a state of panic, and he cried out, what shall we do? And Elisha prayed to God to open his servant's eyes that he may see. And when Elisha's servant opened his eyes, yes, he saw that they were surrounded by troops and an army. But he also saw that God had angels surrounding the troops that surrounded them. And he described them as full of horses and chariots of fire. And so again, focus on the problem solver. Open your spiritual eyes. Stay in prayer. Stop focusing on the problem and focus on the problem solver. Now, notice how everything that Joseph went through, the end result was that he told his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. He wasn't talking about good just for himself. He was talking about good for the situation at hand, which was the famine. He said God meant it for good so that many people would be saved. And Joseph went through all of that and was elevated to be ruler over Egypt and was able to implement a plan whereby he was in charge of saving up food in days of abundance so that when the famine came, people would starve. So it was for the needs of the many that all of these things happened to Joseph and he ended up where he was, the Bible says, so that many lives would be saved. And so I'd like to submit this to you today. Maybe what you're going through isn't just for you. 
maybe it's so you can strengthen your testimony with whomever you come in contact with so that many lives will be saved. Now, I'm not talking about physical lies. I'm talking about spiritual lies. So remember, when you're going through things, don't look at it as transactional, like I'm going through this because God's going to do something for me personally later. That may or may not be true. I don't know. But you just might be going through it so you can help to uh, uh, help someone else or others in general on their journey. It could be that through your testimony that you made it through. You might help someone else make it through. Because remember, you are the only Bible that some people will read. They're looking to see how you act because you claim to be a Christian. They're looking at how you respond during difficult times and adversity. It's not all about you. It's all about drawing somebody else to Christ through not just your words, but how you live and how you treat others. So you have to remember when you go through things, it does not mean that God has forgotten about you. So you have to remain steadfast. You have to remain faithful. And you have to persevere. Your reason for living does not involve the White House. Your reason for living as a Christian has nothing to do with the latest story in the news cycle. Although you should be concerned about those things, your purpose in this life is the Great Commission. To spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to every possible person you can and that doesn't mean standing on a soapbox all the time because people watch what you do more than listen to what you say. My brother Higgins, brother uh, Cliff and I, we talk sometimes and occasionally in Sunday school, Sunday school he'll mention St. Francis of Assisi, A-S-S-I-S-I. St. Francis of Assisi lived during the 12th and the 13th centuries. And St. Francis of Assisi is attributed to making many wonderful quotes. And one of the things that St. Francis of Assisi said was this, and listen to me carefully. He said, always preach the gospel, use words when necessary. People are watching what you do and not what you say. So focus on the problem solver and not the problem. Remember, many, if not all of the characters we read about in the Bible had severe problems, but they were all still able to be used by God. Remember, you're not the only one to ever have a problem. I'm not the only one to ever have a problem. Many of the characters in the Bible we look up to have problems. You remember Abraham? Abraham had a problem. He was old. Elijah was suicidal, and he experienced burnout. Joseph, who we just talked about, he was abused. Job went bankrupt, and he lost everything. Moses had a speech impediment, and when he got to the new land, there was no water. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a womanizer, and he was repeatedly seized by the Spirit of the Lord and blessed with immense strength. Rahab, who was in the lineage of Jesus, was a prostitute. The Samaritan woman was divorced. Noah was a drunk. Jeremiah was young, and he was denied participation in ordinary things of his fellow countrymen. Jacob, Joseph's father, was a cheater. His very name means trickster. David was a murderer and an adulterer. Jonah ran from God and wanted his life to end. They all had problems, but what we remember today is how they chose to handle it and what they chose to do about it in the end. Focus on the problem solver and not the problem. I'm almost done. You can wake up. So this reminds me of when I was a little boy. Occasionally, I would get sent to South Carolina for the summer. And I would stay down there with my cousins. We were all little boys, dirty, filthy little boys, playing in the red clay. Y'all don't know about that. In, in North and South Carolina, they have red dirt. It's really clay. They have it in Alabama. They have it in parts of Florida. And we were down in Georgia, yes. So we were down there, and occasionally we would go to my great-grandmother's house. My great-grandmother lived up a long road, unpaved, rocks, red clay, bumpy. We didn't have a way to get up there. We didn't want to walk. So my cousin, he had a little bicycle, a little boy's bicycle, the one-seater bike. <laughs> and so we would make our way to great-grandmother's house, but there was no place for me to sit, so I would ride on the handlebars. 
You can imagine that fight. And it was a rough ride. It was bumpy. It was rocky. It seemed that every rock knew my backside's name personally. Sometimes we'd experience problems. My foot would get caught in the spokes. Or I think one time I bent the fender and, you know, the wheel was hard turning, so we'd have to get off of the bike and work that out, and we'd get back on the bike and go to great-grandmama's house. But when I got to great-grandmama's house, it turned into a celebration because great-grandmama had a wood stove. Y'all may not even know that exists, you know, all of you city dwellers. She had a wood stove, and what grand, great-grandmama would do, <coughs> she would bake one of my favorite things in life at that time, she would make homemade biscuits. Homemade biscuits in a wood stove, if you've never had that, you have not lived life, <laughs> I'm telling you. She would make homemade biscuits in the wood stove, and she had something known as, wait for it, Cairo syrup. And, and, and when she made those biscuits, she would have jam and she would have Cairo syrup and they were delicious with the syrup and the jam and it made everything that I went through to get there pale in comparison to what I received when I got to great grandmama's house. Because knowing what was waiting on me at the end of the, of the ride made the journey worth it all. And so that's what I'm saying to you. God has something great in store for you and sometimes if you go through things, the road may seem a little rocky. The road may seem bumpy. You may have to get off and regroup. But in the end, it's all going to be worth it. It reminds me of Jeremiah 29 and 11 where God tells us, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans of welfare, not for calamity, but to give you future and hope. Well, brother preacher, I hear all that you said about Joseph. And Brother Preacher, I hear I'm supposed to focus on the problem solver and not the problem. And Brother Preacher, I don't even really like biscuits. <laughs> How do I keep from getting discouraged when I'm in the middle of my problems and my family has problems? Well, I'm reminded of a story as I take my seat, and I hope this will help to encourage you if my, my, my story about me and the biscuits did not. <laughs> There was a man who went to an art gallery. And in the art gallery, they had many beautiful paintings and sculptures. And he began to look around the art gallery, and many people were in the art gallery with him. And he admired all of the beautiful paintings, and he was drawn to one. And the title of this painting was called Checkmate. And it was simply a painting, an oil painting, of a chessboard. And it had the pieces arranged in such a way that it was checkmate. And he passed by it, he admired it, and he went on to admire all of the other works of art in the museum. But he would keep coming back to this painting. He would stare at it for a minute, and he would go on and admire all of the other art in the museum. But ultimately, he would come back to this painting time and time again. And so eventually, he came back to the painting, and he was transfixed. He could not turn away from the painting. And he stood there five minutes, ten minutes, looking at the painting, and people were walking by. He didn't notice them too much. He just stared intensely at the painting. And all of a sudden, he began to jump up and down, and he began to scream uncontrollably, and security came over, and the people were saying, what's wrong? What's the problem? And he said, look, look at the painting. It's called Checkmate. He said, but look, can't you see it? The game's not over. The king still has a move. The king still has a move. The king still has a move. Well, saints of God, I stopped by to tell you very quickly, when you're going through your problems, don't fret too much about them because the king still has a move. When things look hopeless and you have your back up against the wall, you can think about it, but don't lose too much sleep because the king still has a move. When you can't see your way out, and it looks like you want to throw in the towel. Don't worry about it too much, plan your plan, because the king still has a move. When your back is up against the wall and there's nowhere to turn and it seems like all is lost, don't lose too much sleep because the king still has a move. 
The king still has a move. The king still has a move. Don't focus on your problem. Focus on your problem solver. Why? Because the king still has a move. God bless you. Amen, amen. If you didn't like that chiral syrup, that's on you. That's, that's just your own issue. Amen. We like those biscuits, so thank you, sir. And I told you we were going to hear at least a story. And uh, there were many stories to be told. But all of us have a problem. And all of us are left with a way to solve it. And I hope you heard Reverend Nickens clearly. He wasn't saying for us to fix it, even though he asked, how are you going to fix it? He said, the way to fix it is to look to the problem solver. And that's what this moment is all about in our time of worship together. It's whether you're going to make that choice, make that decision to not allow all the challenges, the issues that have been plaguing your life over the years and over the decades, but that you are really going to look to the hills from which cometh your help, knowing your help comes from the Lord. Knowing that I can't fix this on my own, that I have to look to God. I mean, he gave that example of Joseph and so many others, all of those through the hall of fame in the Bible, whether it's David or Abraham. The common denominator is the presence of the Holy Spirit and how God restored them, regardless of the issues, the challenges, and even the sins in their lives. Everybody sitting in here today has an issue, and that issue is sin. And none of us can fix it on our own. If you're here and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want to make that choice, you want to make that decision, you want to understand that the king has one more move in your life, and we invite you, if you're present here, to stand. Come on down. Our ministers and deacons are here, and they're willing to talk with you about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I already noticed people coming down for prayer as well. Feel free if there's something on your heart, on your mind, that is a blessing or a burden. Feel free to come down. Our ministers and deacons are here and willing to pray with you and pray for you. And we want to be clear as well that the scripture says tomorrow is not promised. And all of us have sinned. And the wages of those sins is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. There's only two destinations when it's all said and done, heaven and hell. And we make a choice in the now as to where we want to reside eternally. Regardless of how long you've been living, it may feel like you've been around a few days, a few months, a few years. And time seems like it just continues to, fo to go forward. But the amount of time you've already lived and whatever God still gives you is nothing in comparison to eternity. Eternity. And so we have these fleeting moments to make a decision about how we're going to spend eternity. You think, man, it's been hard over the last three days. It's been hard over the last three weeks. It's been hard over the last three months. Can you admit, imagine eternal difficulty. That's why salvation is so important. 173,451 people per day, two people per second, dying on their way to hell. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is a day to make that choice, to make that decision. as we're speaking, please would come down. If the Lord moves on your heart, you want to make that choice, you want to make that decision. I know it takes courage. It's not easy to stand up in front of everyone and say, man, I, I need Christ in my life. But it's so much better to stand up and say, I need Christ in my life than it is to fall down without him. And eternity is what's at stake, not just this moment. And what Reverend Nickens was saying, I hope you held on to as well. You know, salvation is very personal, and it will be a tremendous blessing to you.
But when you get saved, do you know it impacts those that are around you? you know, there's a lot of lostness in this world. And when we say that 173, 451, do you know that could be your parent? Some of us it is. You know, some of it is, it's our children. You know, some of them, it's our spouses. You know, some of it's those cousins that Reverend Nickens was speaking of. Some of it's our friends, our coworkers. So when you get saved, it's not just your blessing, it's also a blessing to someone else because you can say, man, I went to church and the Lord moved on my heart and I don't know, I just got up and I walked down and I accepted him and then all of a sudden at work, what are they saying? Well, man, you are different. You cussed me out yesterday, but today, right? Yeah, not only a blessing for you, as Reverend Nickens was saying, it could be a blessing for others. Amen. If you don't mind, stand, give us your name, tell us why you came down. My name is Kylie Smith. I came down because I want to be baptized. Praise the Lord, Kylie Smith. We are so proud of you. Tell us how old you are. I am 10 years old. 10 years old, and she wants to be baptized. And she's been coming faithfully in Sunday school, and we just praise God for your courage to stand and come on down and say, I want to be baptized. You've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Mm. Like, yeah. He said, what do that mean? But, but you're going to go and talk with some of the counselors. They're going to explain all that stuff. You should say, I want to get baptized, right? Amen. God bless you. We accept you upon your statement. We're going to have you go with Sister Franklin. She's going to tell you more about Jesus. Sign you up for some Sunday school as well. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand of praise. Amen. And let's give Reverend John B. Nickens a hand of encouragement as well for the word of God. Amen. Amen. Good to have him back home, and uh, we have it on video and internet and everything else that he will be a forever member of St. Stephen, so we know that. We can rest on our feet together as well. We are ready to go to Sunday school. We are not Christian cool unless we, and we have a tremendous lesson. Didn't plan it this way, but the lesson is on the ministry of reconciliation and that we have a gospel that has reconciled us to God and then a challenge for us to reconcile ourselves to others. Amen. Great Sunday school lesson. Don't skip out on it. Uh, let's go on in and have a good time in the Lord and learn and glean from one another. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for meeting us in this place. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for Reverend Nickens, his heart, his passion. Lord, we do understand that we all have problems, we all have issues, we all have challenges. But we're grateful that you give us the problem solver. We're grateful that you give the fixed. And as he closed, we're most grateful, Lord, that you always have one more move. Bless and keep as we move forward. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, the only wise God, be glory, majesty, dominion, power, and the whole church of God said, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's make it a great week. Happy Memorial Day. God bless you.